Yes. Those who manage to make it. <laughs> so, uh, all right. Are there any questions about, um, I don't know, metaphysics exercises or anything like that before I start? Okay. Um, I just put up number eight. There is no number seven. I just put up number eight. Uh, this so, all right. Um, okay, so we're starting with Spinoza. Um, Benedict Spinoza, Will Spinoza. Also, in fact, I think this is what it says on, on the text we have. Sometimes you hear him called Baruch Spinoza. So he was um, he was Jewish. He was born in the, uh, I guess, Spanish-Portuguese community in Amsterdam. Um, and uh, Baruch was his original name, but when he... Uh, well, he, so he was um, excommunicated, so to speak. I mean, that's not not exactly the same thing as excommunication, but he was expelled from the Jewish community of Amsterdam. Um, apparently because of his views on the authorship of the Bible, I think that was the controversy. Um, not so much like his his theological views per se. Um, but so in any case, after that, he never he, he never really uh, formally converted to Christianity, but he wrote as a Christian. Um, and he changed his name. It's not really a change, it's a translation. He, changed, he translated his Hebrew name Baruch to a Latin name Benedictus. Um, that's most, that means the same thing. This is also like uh, Barack Obama means that same Greek Swahili. Anyway, um, so right. So as I said, it. It seems um, I should have written his dates here, but I didn't, I didn't copy them to my notes. But uh, he was born in 1634 and he died in. Anyway, if I could, I should have that down here and I should be comparing it to take heart. But I didn't put it in my notes, and it's too late now. I'm not going to start going to Wikipedia. All right, <laughs> you can you can do that yourself. Um, but um, uh, right. So as I was saying, uh, like apparently, what caused him trouble in the Jewish community, and this is before he wrote the works that we have, right? So, but apparently, he was going around saying that you know the. Uh, um, first five books of the Bible weren't written by Moses and stuff like that. That's what got him in trouble. Um, but uh, what later uh, got him the reputation of a heretic and an atheist is more his metaphysical writings. So, uh, well, his metaphysical writings... Um, The title of this book is The Ethics. When we get to the end, you'll see why it's called that. <laughs> um, it's, it, it's not really just a book of metaphysics, but, um, but it's certainly, uh, for most of it, seems to be talking about metaphysics. Um, well, maybe I shouldn't even say that, but like at least for the first three books, that's what it seems to be talking about. Um, and, um, 
it says, uh, you know, a lot of stuff about God, and it's not the right stuff. <laughs> In fact, it's so different from either the Aristotelian tradition or the religious tradition that, uh, that you know, it, that's, he was considered an atheist. Um, right? In other words, even though everything in this book is about God and how important God is, people said, but the way you, you, based on what you say about God, that's, that's not what you should mean by God, right? That's something else. Um, uh, basically what it's, it's, it's the world, it's not God, right? So, um, Hegel, uh, Hegel's comment in response to this was that, uh, it was unfair that Hague, that Spinoza was caught was charged with atheism. He was really an acosmist, right? That it was it's the world Spinoza didn't believe him. He only believed in God, <laughs> which has um, you know a certain uh, accuracy to it. I think, although I think you can also understand and maybe you can understand better as we go along why um, people classified this as atheist instead. Um, so therefore, you know, um, what I said before about proofs of the existence of God and whatever, like, it's especially important here. Like he'll, he'll say things that it sounds like he's being very pious, you know, but you have to stop and ask, okay, what does this really mean? And that's even more true in the readings from the theological political treatise. So the, the theological political treatise is um, basically aimed at showing that uh, government should allow religious freedom. <laughs> like that's the actual, you know, end he's working towards. Um, but so the part that I um, asked you to read the just the beginning of from today is about how to interpret the Bible. Um, and it starts off sounding um, fundamentalist in the technical sense of fundamentalist, right? Like uh, the you know, we have to go back to the literal interpretation of the Bible and it's sacrilege the way people have tried to substitute their human interpretation, whatever, right? Um, but if you pay careful attention, by the end of that first reading, he's already made the following points. So number one, Scripture largely consists of narratives and visions. And um, those are things that pass the understanding in the sense that we can't demonstrate from first principles whether a certain thing happened in history or whether someone had a certain vision. <laughs> right? So, um, so you can't tell what those are except by reading them, right? That is, um, especially because, as he also emphasizes, um, the narratives and and the the visions are quote unquote adapted to the minds of the readers and writers, right? What that means is that. Uh, an unbiased observer wouldn't necessarily tell the same story as the person who wrote the text we have. It's right, this, it's, um, this is like the way things seem to them. He says in passing in this reading why, that that's part of his explanation of what a miracle is. A miracle is not a violation of the laws of nature, which is impossible. A, a, a miracle is something striking that happened that was adapted to the mind of a historian. <laughs> right? So they, from their point of view, it seemed like a, it, it seemed like it was uh, it had happened for their purposes, right? And so they described it that way. But of course, it really happened. And we'll see like how strict this is in the ethics. It really happened because of the 
um, eternal and necessary order of causes and effects. <laughs> um, okay, that's number one. Number two, if scripture is, quote unquote, of divine origin, um, the way we can tell that is not because of any of those narratives or visions. The way we can tell that it's of divine origin is it contains more because it contains moral truth that is teaches virtue. And he says, we can deduce, we can deduce from first principles without scripture what moral truth is. Right? So there's so there's two parts in scripture. One passes human understanding, which, you know, when you first read that, it, you, you think it means like it's, you know, magical and mysterious. But when you, if, if you go through carefully what he's saying about it, what it means is that because it's about matters of fact, we can't prove like from first principles what happened. <laughs> Right. So in other words, any any individual thing that happens anywhere passes human understanding. Um, you would need to prove that that specific thing had to happen at that time. You would need an infinite demonstration, basically. It depends on everything else that happened before it. And so we, we can't do that. So, you know, so that's one thing that's in scripture. And the rest of it is the moral doctrine and the moral doctrine which is the only way we know it's divine because it contains moral doctrine is stuff that we could work out on our own. And then finally, that um, the method of interpreting scripture, I mean, he's gonna go into more detail, but he's, but he's basically already laid this out. The method of interpreting scripture is to first figure out what it means does it contain a moral doctrine? How do we know whether it contains a moral doctrine? Well, we can determine for ourselves what the correct moral doctrine is, <laughs> right? So we determine for ourselves what the correct moral doctrine is. Then we read the Bible to see if it contains that doctrine or not. And if it does, then we can regard it as divine. So the result is that like whatever, if anything, is actually divine in scripture, we we don't actually learn from scripture itself. <laughs> we we knew it before and we had to know it before in order to determine that it was divine. It also means obviously that any book is divine if you if you find that it contains moral doctrine. <laughs> right. Um Okay, so that's just an example of how how Spinoza can say something mm -hmm. that sounds, you know, um, religiously zealous or something like that, but that if but that a careful reader is going to say, "Hold on a second, <laughs> this is this is saying that 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 their religion has no authority beyond the authority of of." morality. Okay, anyway, that's um, that's all I'm going to say about the theological political treatise for now. I um, and I probably will say more about it when we finished all the readings from it. I just I divided it into different readings just because it would be too much to ask you to read it all at once and the ethics stuff. But I mean, I guess ideally, the course would be much longer and I would be able to have this lecture about it. <laughs> that, would, that, that would also be horrible. All right, anyway. <laughs> um, okay, so are there questions about what I said so far? Because uh, next I'm gonna go on to talk about the content of the ethics. Um. I could probably tell you more about Spinoza's life, although oh. I mean, he kind of lived by himself when he was a lens grinder. <laughs> yeah. 
school where he said just now, uh, there was like, I thought you said there was three important like aspects of the scripture he talked about, which is like, like the scripture of almost like a single person point of view. And if you wanted to know, like, the actual event he just passed over, like, he's like, looking up on a specific people's point of view. Well, no, it's more like if you want to know what story they're telling, the only way to tell is to read the story. Because number one, you can't prove from first principles what the story is. And number two, even if you had like, which we don't usually for the Bible, but even if you had independent sources, you couldn't use those necessarily to determine what the narrator is saying because the narrator is speaking from their own point of view. And it's not just one person, right? It's uh, like different books are written at different times by different people. So you have to take that into account. Um, and the books aren't necessarily written by the people that they're officially attributed to. <laughs> He's going to talk about all that later. Um, this is it's it, this is basically the beginning of modern modern biblical criticism. Um, you know that's the, or at least the methodology he's setting out here. If you if we read the rest of the book, you would see that it's similar to Hobbes in this way. Um, they Hobbes also like sets out a method of reading the Bible that's very similar to this. But then when you go on in their books and you, they actually interpret the Bible, they read their political opinions in, right? So like Hobbes proves that Israel was always an absolute monarchy, which is like really, really hard to find in the text of the Old Testament, if you read it, you know? And on the other hand, Spinoza proves that it was a democracy, basically. Like it's not, you know, <laughs> it's, um, uh, so they don't actually necessarily do what they're saying, which is another issue. Uh, I think of that less as, but it's hard to know for sure with these things, but I think of it less as a lapse and more as you're supposed to notice that. <laughs> and therefore, like, understand that they're not really resting themselves on the authority of the Bible. But I'm, I'm more sure about that in Spinoza's case than Hobbes. Hobbes is a little bit... Um, Dogmatic. I know. Anyway. <laughs> oh, all right. So that was a good question. Is it, that was one of the things I, I actually I actually had four points. I well, maybe the fourth one was just a summary of what you can get from the other three, but okay. Are there other questions about that? What's the last one? The fourth one was, we test whether scripture is divinely revealed by comparing it to our own moral conclusion. Yeah, maybe I didn't say that clearly, but. Um, um, I mean, it's tricky. Well. Maybe I shouldn't even say that. So if you were to compare what Spinoza says to what Maimonides says, and I, I think I've mentioned Maimonides before, kind of the greatest Jewish philosopher of the Middle Ages, wrote in Arabic, um, he was born in Spain, lived in Egypt. Um, but his, uh, his works were translated to Hebrew during his own lifetime for this European Jews who didn't know Arabic. They wanted to be able to read. Um, so, and they were translated to Latin in the Middle Ages too. I, I suppose Spinoza read it in Hebrew. He quotes it in Latin. But in any case, um, I mean, we'll see him quoting Maimonides explicitly. But in, in the like, some of the things he said, like when he says that um, you can't tell whether someone is a prophet because by their performance of miracles you can tell because they because what they say is in accord with the law of reason or something like that like Maimonides also says that <laughs> um uh so not all of this is new with Spinoza but 
Um, and like what the disagreement actually is, is might be hard to figure out, especially because Maimonides is also a very tricky author. Um, all right, but anyway, I I guess I won't get diverted on that. It's not a course about Maimonides, thankfully. That would be really hard. All right. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm, I'm going to go on to talk about the ethics, unless there's more questions about stuff. I think we can talk about it again after uh, we finish the readings from the Theological Political Treatise. Uh, I guess I should say, you know, why is it popular now to call him Baruch instead of Benedict or Benedictus, even though he published his books under the name of Benedictus? Part, part of the reason, but I feel that I feel kind of uneasy about this actually, is a desire to reclaim him as a Jewish philosopher. So like, um, a friend of mine said on Facebook, and it was kind of a joke, but it was, but I feel like there's something a little bit serious in it. He was like, he's calling, Spinoza Baruch dead naming. <laughs> okay. It's you know, it's a good question. He like he didn't he you know he he didn't want to be seen as a Jewish philosopher. Um and the motives to trying to reclaim him as a Jewish philosopher are a little bit well, I don't know. I probably shouldn't say more about that. It's not not relevant. To this course, I think. All right, but anyway, the content of the ethics. So I think the ethics is a is a pretty difficult book. <laughs> I think you I, I assume that you you've gathered that from reading the first part of it. Um, again, ideally, although this and again this wouldn't ideal be ideal because it would mean this course would go on forever and ever. <laughs> But ideally, we should go through it step by step. <laughs> you know, explain the proof of every theorem and discuss whether it works and, you know, et cetera. So, like, obviously, um, um, I mean, that would be good because, number one, you know, the arguments are incredibly detailed and it's like it's hard to understand every single every single one raises questions and are, is, is hard to understand. Um, it's it has the form of a geometrical treatise, specifically of Euclid, right? Like it's modeled on Euclid, but reading it is not very much like reading Euclid. Okay, right? like the issues that come up about whether the proofs work or not are just not the same. They just don't come up in Euclid, right? I mean, this is, um, this is in some ways an old story in philosophy and, and, or, or, and in some ways maybe is special to modern philosophy, I don't know, but um, where philosophers are impressed and threatened by the success of mathematics and then especially modern natural science when that starts to emerge. And um, I mean, it is, it's a very disturbing thing because that was, something philosophers were supposed to be able to do. But it turns out that these people who are clearly not philosophers now, Ray, like, I mean, in Spinoza's time, it's it's too early, like they don't have terminology to say this, right? And moreover, it is often the same people, even a little bit later, right? Like Newton and Leibniz or whatever, right? It is often the same people, um, but uh, who are both philosophers and physicists. But I think it's already starting to become clear, even though they don't have the words for it, that these are two completely different activities and that someone who's good at one may not be good at the other. <laughs> um, um, so in any case, um, um, 
So like in the face of that one response the philosophers have will be to like try to adopt what they see as the secret. You know, what made the mathematicians so successful? Well, they did this, that, and the other thing. Um, something like that happened again in the early 20th century in the history of analytic philosophy, I think, and we're still kind of living with it. Um, so you see things in contemporary philosophy that are similar to this, like numbered propositions, and, you know, it kind of looks like it could be a math paper, or, you know, so, but it never actually works, <laughs> right? Like, I, I mean, I asked a friend of mine who's a mathematician once, I said, so like, does anyone ever publish a paper in mathematics just to point out a problem in someone else's proof? And he said, well, no, I mean, if you find a problem in the proof, contact the editors of the journal and they contact the author and the author either fixes the proof or issues a retraction. <laughs> if you've read philosophy journals, you know that every paper is like defending against a problem that someone else claimed to find in a problem that someone else claimed to find for someone else's proof. <laughs> like it just goes on and on. So it like it doesn't actually work. It doesn't make mathematics like geometry i mean it doesn't make philosophy like geometry and that's true for spinoza too um but it doesn't mean that the method isn't interesting and important um and that i guess is the other reason it would be nice to go through one little step at a time because um like you know we would i could say more about exactly what spinoza's method actually is but um Okay, so obviously that won't be possible, especially if I keep going into these long digressions. <laughs> so, um, um, okay, so uh, so what can I say more more generally to start out? I mean, like today, I am going to try to go through this initial argument in the first fifteen propositions of Book One in some detail, but first like starting with the axioms and definitions. Um, what is the status of these axioms and where do they come from? So there's a remark in the second scolium to proposition eight, right? So a scolium is like, uh, I mean, you see these in books in the late Middle Ages, other books around this time, right? Like Newton's Principia, Scolia. It's kind of like when you, I guess maybe, did they have them in ancient geometrical texts? There aren't any in Euclid, but I don't know. Anyway, um, a scolium is like where you kind of like step outside the formal framework and make a, a less formal remark, you know? So, so in the school in the second scolium to after proposition eight, um, he says, if men were to attend to the nature of substance, by the way, as so. This is the right, the original is Latin, and you know, what the word that's being translated as man is homo. This this doesn't mean man as opposed to woman. Probably should possibly should be translated as human being. Um, but in any case, I'm just gonna follow the translation. But if men were to attend to the nature of substance. They would, not, they would not doubt at all the truth of Proposition 7. So Proposition 7 is existence belongs to the nature of substance, which means that something like Descartes' fifth meditation proof of the existence of God applies to any substance. Or he hasn't revealed yet that there's only one substance, <laughs> right? That's coming up. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, okay, so anyway, so, you know, he says in the beginning of Scolium that Proposition 7 is going to seem strange to people, 
right? Like if you think that a good example of a substance is Bucephalus, and then you read Proposition 7 and it says existence belongs to the essence of every substance, then you're saying, wait, Bucephalus is a necessary existence? Right, like I'm sorry, I didn't get a chance to talk about the ontological group. Um, but, um, but roughly speaking, the ontological proof worked by showing that the concept of God in includes existence. So that when you're thinking about God, you're thinking about God as existing. So you so you can't, without contradiction, deny that God exists. That's that's roughly speaking what the ontological proof is, and as I said, that's the that's the proof that Descartes has a version of in the fifth meditation. So now Proposition Seven seems to be saying you could do the same thing for Bucephalus. When you think of Bucephalus, you're thinking of Bucephalus as existing. So you can't, without contradiction, deny that Bucephalus exists. That doesn't seem right. <laughs> So, but but Spinoza says, yeah, people who aren't accustomed to thinking about things right um, will find this surprising. But if men were to attend to the nature of substance, they would not doubt at all the truth of Proposition 7. Indeed, this proposition would be an axiom to all. So the, the, what I want to focus on here is that... Um, and by the way, Descartes also says something like this. This is in it, when near his version of the ontological proof in the fifth meditation on page 109, it's AT69. But as regards God, <clears throat> if I were not overwhelmed by preconceived opinions, and if the images of things perceived by the senses did not besiege my thought on every side, I would certainly acknowledge him sooner and more easily than anything else. Right. So in other words, what Spinoza and Descartes are both saying, I think, that um, um, what comes first, what's like an axiom in your argument is depends on who you're talking to. Um, and they're they're both saying it about the same example, not coincidentally, I guess, but I mean, I should say um, that um, besides Maimonides um, and um, uh, uh, Latin medieval philosophy, I guess it's, I mean, it's clear at least that he, that he read Thomas Aquinas, um, like uh, the most important influence on Spinoza was Descartes. Right, so he's he's a he's a kind of uh, like renegade follower of Descartes. Um, so uh, and he's constantly thinking about Descartes. Um, so axioms are like are selected to be things that a certain audience will accept without worries, basically. If you have an audience that um, like can see the truth of a certain thing right away, then you can use that as an axiom. But if, but if you have a different audience that's like confused by the images of their senses and, um, and or by the tradition, by the books they've been reading, Right. Remember, like, remember, those are the kind of two things that Descartes says in that quote. He only mentions the senses, but obviously the other one is also relevant here. Uh, if they're kind of like distracted and confused by those things, you might have to start with something else that you can get them to accept. Um, so I think that's basically how Spinoza chooses his axioms. Um, um, I mean, he also clearly, in some way, wants to keep the number and strength of axioms down, just the way, like, you know, a uh, um, modern mathematician would, would want to do, right? Like, let's make sure we don't, make sure that, that 
These are exactly the axioms we need to prove what we're trying to prove. But I think that's kind of secondary. I don't think he's, I, I, I don't think it's clear that he's tried to reach the absolute minimum or to make sure that none of the axioms depend in any way on the others or something like that. Um, and similarly, I think the definitions are supposed to be things that the intended audience are going to find unproblematic. I mean, you might think that those two cases are really different because with the axiom, you you know, you might think, well, with an axiom, I have to choose something that's true. <laughs> um, whereas with a definition, it can't be false. You can define things however you want. Um, but uh, again, that's not true if you're trying to prove something to people who already, you know, are using the words that you're using. <laughs> I mean, um, you you want to you want to get them to accept that you're using them right and then show something they don't expect. And that's so um, so like in particular, um, with respect to definitions three and five, By substance, I mean that which is in itself and is conceived through itself. So I, maybe I read that a little bit wrong. That which is in itself and is conceived through itself, right? He keeps putting those two things together. This is that same rationalist strategy that I was mentioning in Descartes, right? That, that, um, if you can, only think of A by thinking of B, then A can't exist without B. <laughs> Whereas if you can think of A through itself without B, then A can exist by itself without B. Right? So those two things is in itself and conceive can be conceived through itself go together. Although um, Spinoza isn't saying who's doing the conceiving here. Um, so, uh, like, this is a good example of, you know, like, you may hear that you shouldn't use passive voice very much when you're writing because it's kind of like vague or weak or something like that. But in philosophy, all those rules have a, like, have a certain, have a different reason. Like in philosophy, you shouldn't use the passive voice unnecessarily because when you need it, <laughs> you want to make sure that it says what it's supposed to, right? So like this is a good example of the use of the correct use of passive in philosophy. It enables him to be say to say can be conceived without addressing the issue of who has to be able to conceive it. <laughs> All right. Anyway, um, um, so by substance, I mean that which is in itself and is conceived through itself. That is, that the conception of which does not require the conception of another thing from which it has to be formed. Um, Well, um, so this basically echoes Descartes' definition of substance. Um, I don't know if I mentioned that, you know, but his definition of substance and the principles of philosophy. Uh, Substance is something that needs no other thing to exist. Um, nulla re indicat ad existendi. <laughs> hmm. 
no thing does it need <laughs> to exist. So Spinoza instead says, Cujus conceptus non indicet concepta alterius re. Concepta, I, I'm going back between different pronunciations of Latin. Um, its concept whose concepts does not need the concept of another thing. Right, so it's basically the same definition, only, right, Descartes says the thing, that it doesn't need any other thing to exist. And Spinoza is saying its concept doesn't need any, the concept of anything else. But again, because those two things for both of them are equivalent, this is basically the same definition. <laughs> um, and uh, it's, so, so this is, a. Uh, uh, um, your Cartesian reader is going to read this definition and say, oh yeah, fine. <laughs> and an Aristotelian reader also is not going to have problems with this definition, right? I mean, actually, um, Descartes isn't the first one to define substance this way. It's not Aristotle's definitions we saw, but it's like the ancient Neoplatonists define substance this way. Um, and uh, and and it's certainly based on things Aristotle says, right? That substances are first in um, first in being, first in definition, first in knowledge, right? They're primary, and accidents are secondary. So this is basically like a not surprising definition of substance. Um, and similarly, definition five. By mode, I mean the affections of substance. That is, that which is in something else and is conceived through something else. That's, you know, um, um, that which is in something else and is conceived through something else. Like you can hear, that's, that's still a version of that original definition of accident in the categories. Right, it's in it's in a subject that is it's in it, not as a part, but it can't uh, incapable of existing apart from it. Um, so again, I think a Cartesian reader or an Aristotelian reader is going to look at definition five and say, "Oh yeah, that's the definition of a mode or accident." Um, so, um, so we have. Mode, which as in, as in Descartes, essentially means what Aristotelians call accident. They also sometimes call it um, affectus, which is what uh, Spinoza first says here, right? By mode, I mean the affections of substance. And then in between, we have one other thing, which is attributes. So we saw how Descartes used attribute, well, especially how he used principal attribute, right? Remember, Descartes says um, every substance has a single principal attribute that says what it is, and all its other modes, it's, or all its all its modes have to be things that can only be thought through that attribute. And what attributes, what principal attributes are there according to Descartes? Um, extension and thinking or thought, right? Um, so there are substances that are defined, that, whose essence consists in extension, and their only properties are extension and its modes. Right, so the modes being again things that are unthinkable except in extension, it's like figure, motion, whatever. 
there's also time and number, which are a little bit weird. Um, and they're a little bit weird in Spinoza too. And Kant is going to call attention to that. <laughs> but let me ignore that for now. All right. So, um, okay. So attribute, the way Descartes uses it, or at least the way Descartes uses principal attribute. But is um, is basically Spinoza just calls this attribute. And it's basically the same thing that Aristotelians call differentia. Right? It's, an, it's the essential characteristic that makes the substance the kind of thing that it is. Only, according to Descartes, as I, as I mentioned before, every substance only has one of these, and that means that there's two lowest species of substance, body and mind. Right? So unlike that tree of porphyry with the, with the genus that then was divided into species, but each of those species is a genus to another set of species and so on and so forth, all the way down, there's just one step. There's substance, and then you could you only get to add one differentia because every substance only has one principal attribute. So you can either add extension or thought and you're done. So there's two species, right? Um, but aside from that difference, these are basically the same thing. Okay, and um, and this is Spinoza's definition. By attribute, I mean that which the intellect perceives of substance as constituting its essence. So again, that's a way of saying that it's the essential attribute. There's the essential property. There's no good neutral word to use here. <laughs> the essential characteristic <laughs> that, um, that shows what the substance is. So, um, so we're starting with, and you know, and the same thing goes for the uh, the other definitions, like the definition of God as an absolutely infinite substance, right? That's perfectly standard. Yeah. Yeah. No, he does. That's definition five, right? So this is definition five. This is definition four. And this is definition three. And um, uh, so just be aware that there's going to be new axioms and definitions at, at the beginning of the other books. So this isn't, we haven't seen all the axioms and definitions. Yeah. I guess it's kind of pertinent now because we're talking about attribute. Maybe this is a little too early, but I feel like there's like, uh, when I was reading the, the first you know, set of the proposition, something felt really weird about proposition five. At least, like, I don't know, isn't there like a, a way where he says that, uh, you know, uh, two substances are differentiated by their, or, or what they're distinguished by either difference in attributes or difference in affections? If only by a difference in their attributes, then it'll be conceded that there's only one of the same attribute. But, like, uh, I don't know, can't you have like two substances where they share one attribute and then they have a different attribute otherwise? And then they'd be like, I don't know, like, uh, like, why is it that uh, you can't have substances that have like the same attribute, even if they, they only share an attribute in part? Oh, okay, that's a good question, but let me let me put that off until we get back to that proposition five. All right. Um, um, question yeah. all right i'll think about it and get back to it um all right so um so we start with these like um axioms and definitions that are that are that are supposed to strike the reader as unproblematic um 
And so like, even though this is the synthetic method rather than the analytic method as Descartes defines it, there's still a similarity to what they're doing here. <laughs> Spinoza is still, so to speak, beginning with our old beliefs. Right, only rather than beginning with kind of all our old beliefs <laughs> and then trying to get rid of them to find out what remains, um, Spinoza is beginning with um, with some basic ones among our old beliefs that are supposed to be clearly and distinctly known. That is that it, it was that it seems it would be absurd to doubt or something like that. So, I mean, so he's not going to begin by saying doubt everything. In fact, I think he's going to prove that that's in, that the suspension of judgment that Descartes um, thinks you have to do is impossible. <laughs> so that's not the way to begin. But um, but so but he is he's beginning with a specially selected um, group of our old beliefs. And then he's going to use them to show that almost all of the other old beliefs were wrong. <laughs> um, that is, we're going to, if we, if we follow him, we're going to learn that it was tradition and confusion and um, um, moral corruption that, all three of those kind of mixed together that prevented us from drawing the right conclusion from these correct beliefs that we had. Um, whereas if you um, if you keep your mind clear, you'll get these, this really different result than you expected. And so that means that at least at the very beginning of the ethics, like in the reading for today, especially, there is a kind of like, almost like a meditator character here, right? Like there is until a certain point. So that's why I said like in the scolium to proposition eight, like he hasn't revealed yet that there's only one substance, <laughs> right? Like up to a certain point, we keep believe believing that either the Aristotelian or the Cartesian picture is still going to work. Because after all, again, we, we don't see anything wrong with these axioms and definitions. And we, you know, and we're Cartesians or Aristotelians or something like that. And so, uh, so we expect that from these axioms and definitions, we're going to get a picture of the world that's familiar, right? So uh, like, um, um, so up to a certain point, if, uh, you know, on the one hand, if we're Cartesians, up to a certain point, we're going to think every substance only has one attribute. If we're Aristotelians, up to a certain point, we're going to think that every substance has a list of attributes, but that each attribute is only expresses a part of its essence. Um, I think this is the issue that's gonna that that that's that's gonna explain how Spinoza would ex would respond to what you said. I think, but um, and if you're a Cartesian or an Aristotelian, up to a certain point, you're gonna assume that there can be lots of different substances that are essentially the same and are only different numerically, right? Like Bucephalus and some other horse. Uh, what was the other horse I had before? Oh, it was no Bucephalus. This is Bucephalus, but the other horse I was using as an example before was the Don Quixote's horse. No, because that's not a real horse. A Roman senator horse. Yeah, the the one that Caligula wanted to make a, a consul. Uh, Roman senator horse. I. I forget its name now. Anyway, it just doesn't matter. Some other horse, right? So, like, according to Aristotelians, these these incitatus, yeah, that's right. Or yeah, that's right. You need to remember political horses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
that means so <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think there's other people in my family who would agree with that. My uh, daughters might both agree with that. But anyway, uh, all right. So, um, right. So, if like Aristotelians, we're going to say these both have the same essence, the essence of the species force. Force is the lowest species. How do we know that? Uh, not clear, but force is the lowest species. So these are essentially the same, but they're not numerically the same, right? There, there's two of them. Why? Well, they differ in accents, you know, like, so for example, they're not in the same place at the same time. <laughs> um, uh, and if you're a Cartesian, you're going to think, that even more so in the sense that you're going to think that that what both of these are essentially is bodies. So they have the same essence, extension, but they differ in their modes, shape, size, composition, right? For a complex substance, you have to talk about the little complex body, you have to talk about the little body that it's made of. Um, And then, um, and then Spinoza springs a series of surprises on you, basically. Right? So that you start off thinking everything is normal, and then step by step, you realize that somehow from these apparently um, unproblematic definitions and axioms, he's deriving these really weird results. Um, Although I guess I should say that the results that he derives is, in a way, it's worse than, it's not just unexpected. It's not totally random. In a way, it's worse than that. It's like um, the type of thing that philosophers have been trying to get away from throughout the history of philosophy, right? Like since the... Um, since Plato and Aristotle responded to the pre-Socratics, right? And in particular to Parmenides, who tried to prove that there was only one thing and it filled the whole universe, <laughs> right? So, um, and like, but other things like that too will come up later, right? Like, you know, that uh, everything God does, is, he does by necessity. That's something like philosophers have been trying to make sure wouldn't come out that way. <laughs> um, and Spinoza just stops playing that game and says, guess what? These premises that you think you can accept, they lead exactly to these things. <laughs> um, all right. So, um, so my basic plan, and hopefully I'll get fairly far through this, is to... Um, Well, no, actually, I'm not going to say that yet. At first, I'm going to list what the surprises are. So the, the, the first four propositions um, don't contain any big surprises. Substance is by nature prior to its affections. As I said, that's like that's basically a quote from Aristotle. Two substances having different attributes have nothing in common. There, I mean, it depends exactly what you, you think he means by different attributes, but, uh, but it doesn't sound that bad. Um, it certainly sounds right to a Cartesian, right? Like bodies and minds don't have the same properties, whatever. Um, and anyway, it's right, like he's explicitly allowing us to go along and think that there might be two substances. <laughs> Right. That's why I say there's kind of a plot here, right? That in the, in the very statement of the proposition, he says two substances, even though, of course, he knows, right? I think it's even clearer in this case than in the case of the meditations that he didn't write this in stream of consciousness. 
<laughs> and suddenly like, oh, wait, I proved there's only one. Right? So he knows he's heading in a few propositions for there being only one, but uh, but he's still allowing us to think there could be two. Um, proposition th three, when things have nothing in common, one cannot be the cause of the other. Well, it doesn't. That doesn't sound so bad if you believe in eminent being, right? Uh, it's only when you realize how strictly he means that that it that it turns out to have these weird results. And finally, proposition four: two or more distinct things are distinguished from one another either by the difference of the attributes of the substances. I crossed out the here. Remember, again, there's no articles in Latin, so the translator had to decide whether to put in the. I think it should say, by the difference of the attributes of substances or by the difference of the affections of substances. Those are the way things can differ from each other. Um, again, there doesn't seem anything wrong about that. And then we get the first surprise. So. Right. So the first surprise. So like for now, I'm gonna write, well, maybe I should. So this is how people actually cite Spinoza these days. You would write 1P5. That means proposition five in book one. <laughs> um so uh the first surprise is there are no merely numerically distinct substance, substances. Right? So that thing where you had Bucephalus and Incitatus or and cetatus, <laughs> right? Anyway, that thing is impossible. If, if if they were substances, of course, that is. I mean, Spinoza doesn't deny that there is more than one horse. That just shows that horses are not substances, <laughs> right? So um, there can't be numerically distinct substances. That's the first surprise. Um, the second surprise is. And this is proposition six and seven that um, every substance is self caused and therefore it's a necessary existence. Okay, that, as I said, is really surprising. <laughs> um, by the way, so this one is Leibniz is going to keep. So Leibniz and Spinoza agree with each other this far. Um, this one, Leibniz is not going to keep. <laughs> All right. Um, so, uh, Right, so this is surprising again, because it means that you can run the ontological proof for any substance. You can, you can prove that the, the substance must exist in, this, in the same way you can prove that a triangle, the angles have to add up to two right angles. Um, okay, and then the third surprise, this is proposition 11. I, I don't know if I should say this is a surprise or not. I mean, there's one substance that has all attributes. So, I mean, why might, why does this, what about this is surprising or not surprising? Well, I mean, in some sense, this is right, and this substance is God, of course, right? So, um, 
in some sense, that's not surprising because remember, like Descartes also said, God has, you know, infinitely many infinite perfections. All the perfections that finite things have to a finite degree, God has to an infinite degree. Um, however, of course, Descartes doesn't really think that, they, that, that God is a very big body. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't say very big, because that's, I mean, when Spinoza is going to say that God is an infinite body, but not because he's very big. <laughs> um, but, but anyway, I'll talk about that when we get to it. But, um, uh, right, that, that is, Descartes doesn't think that, that God literally has the perfection that, that finite substances have. Or to be more, to use ter Descartes' terminology, he doesn't think those perfections have formal being in God. They have eminent being in God. But, um, from, so, like, the surprise is, comes from understanding where this comes from in Spinoza and where it's going and realizing that, no, he means the very same thing we think of as characterizing finite bodies, God has infinitely. And then the fourth surprise, which is Proposition 14, is that there is no other substance. So again, as I said, or as, as Hegel said, we've proved that the world doesn't exist, only God exists. There are no finite substances. Um, so what I want to do is go backwards through this series and explain how it happened. <laughs> but what I also want to do, but I'm afraid this is going to take too long, so maybe I'll just allude to it. There, there, there appears to be, there's something that can look like a mistake in terms of like Spinoza saying that everything is either caused to exist by something else or causes itself to exist. And like, um, you might think that either, that something is either caused to exist by something else or causes itself to exist, if that even makes sense, or is not caused to exist and it doesn't exist, <laughs> right? Um, and, but I think, uh, I mean, you have to look back at the definition of self-caused, which is definition one, I, I believe. By that which is self-caused, I mean that whose essence involves existence or that whose nature can be conceived only as existing. And what we're saying here, that, that everything has to either be caused by something else or has to be self-caused means that um, if you're thinking of something at all, <laughs> then you're thinking of it either in a way that um, you need some other thought to make sense of it. And then you're thinking of it as caused by something else. Or you're thinking it in a such a way that um, you don't need the concept of anything else to think it. And then you're thinking of it um, as not needing anything else to exist. So you're thinking of it as existing. <laughs> That's, yeah. But so. If you're thinking of something that doesn't need anything else to exist, then that means it's a substance, right? So that means that you're thinking of God. 
Yeah, uh, but I mean, again, but you're like you're you're going, I'm going you're, too far. you're going ahead to the conclusion. Okay. But I'm I'm just talking about like you know the proof of Proposition mm -hmm. Seven. I mean, Spinoza also talks about this in the Scolia that like you know it, it seems like something has gone wrong because it seems like we you know a, a substance can't be caused to exist by another substance. Um, and therefore it can't be caused to exist by anything other than itself. And, you know, it seems like you should say, so maybe it doesn't exist at all, but instead you say it has to exist, right? But the, but, but the point is that like you're, 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 again, it's this rational equivalence, rationalist equivalence between thinking of something um, a certain way and it being that way. It has to be the way you're thinking of it because that's the thing you're thinking of. <laughs> and you're thinking of it as um, not needing anything else to exist. So you're thinking of it as already existing. <laughs> so you already believe it exists, basically. You just notice that. <laughs> Um, you know, like I'm not claiming that this that that proof is like without any problems or anything like that, or that the ontological proof is without problems. Um, I mean, if you like, if you take 106 next quarter, I'll tell you why Kant thinks it, it, it doesn't work. But um, but just to make it like just like there is a way of thinking you can get into where this proof seems reasonable. Yeah, did you have a question? I mean, I was, no, I lost it. I was, I was okay. It it's better for me not to get sidetracked because I do want to go back to, right. So, um, okay, so the, so, so this was the most surprising one, right? That there's only one substance. Um, and, it basically follows from this and this um, um along with the definition of God and the definition of attributes. Um, so like definition six, by God, I mean an absolutely infinite being. That is substance consisting of infinite attributes, each of which expresses eternal and infinite essence. So that that sounds innocent because because when we first read it, because first of all we still believe in eminent being, right? So we don't know that um, God is literally getting the same attributes as that that supposedly created things are going to have. Um, so like. Um, Proposition three, if you know how serious Spinoza is, as I pointed out, proposition three, when things have nothing in common, one cannot be the cause of the other, already rules out eminent being, right? But again, like we're not noticing that yet, <laughs> how serious is he is about it. Um, that's one reason definition six sounds innocent. Um, Another reason it sounds innocent is because we don't know about A. So we think something could differ from God just numerically. I mean, of course, we wouldn't really think that, right? That would that's polytheism, but <laughs> but that's like floating in the back of our mind. And also we don't understand how seriously definition four is meant. So definition four, the definition of attribute. By attribute, I mean that which the intellect perceives of substance as constituting its essence. Um, so 
we think that, and I think this is also the answer what you were asking before. Uh, we think that like God could differ from created things because God has all the attributes and they only have one of them. And it's because we're thinking of these attributes as parts of the essence, the way um, uh, Aristotelians think of differentia. Um, so like, I, you know, like I could have, I have some differentiate in common with Bucephalus and I differ from Bucephalus and others. Um, but definition four actually says that an attribute expresses the whole essence of the substance. Every attribute expresses the whole essence of the substance. So a substance can have more than one attribute. Um, but um, any substance that shares any attribute with this one, right? So like, here's the way we're thinking about it. We're thinking this one has this, this one has this, and they both share this dotted one, okay? But if they both share this one, this one expresses the entire essence of this substance. And this one expresses the entire essence of this substance. So they're essentially they're essentially the same. So you can't have you 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 can't have like a partial overlap this way. And um and like again, if you read definition four um strictly, it says that, but you don't notice it until Spinoza uses it. <laughs> read definition four. Yeah. I don't know. By attribute, I mean that which the intellect perceives as substances as constituting it of substance or of a substance, right? Again, there's no articles in that, right? So by attribute, I mean that which the intellect perceives of a substance as constituting its essence, right? It's constituting its whole essence. But, I, but again, that's like, um, you don't realize that until you see what Spinoza does with it. <laughs> Um, right. So, um, so like, once you know what he means by God and what he means by attributes, then you can see this shows that no substance could differ from God merely numerically. Because no substances can differ from each other merely numerically. Right? Like, you don't have to, um, go through a big argument to show that there can't be two infinitely perfect substances that are that are exactly the same that just happen to be two of them because that can never happen with substances we already proved that um and then this one says that there's no attributes left for any other substance to have <laughs> yeah the Part B, the seven specifically, I think. Or, yeah. Wait, no, uh, eleven. Sorry. That, yeah. So that, eleven. That's surprise C. Yeah. Yeah, but um, if it takes up all the attributes, and then you use the fact that it has taken up all the attributes to prove that nothing else, and there are no other substances. If you just proved the existence of one other substance first, then like if if the arguments there could apply to anything else, doesn't it seems to me to be somewhat arbitrary to choose to prove the existence of God rather than Bucephalus, and then disprove Bucephalus with God rather I mean, than so Bucephalus can't be a a substance by this definition, right? Because Bucephalus is not infinite and it's not a necessary yeah. existence and whatever, right? I mean, even before you get to Proposition Eleven, you've ruled out Bucephalus, but. Um, so I think like you could imagine proving that there's an uh, infinite extended substance. But I think Spinoza will then be able to prove that that infinite extended substance also has all the other attributes, <laughs> right? And by similar arguments to the ones he makes in, prop in the proof of Proposition 11 or in the scolium, 
or the scolia to proposition 11 read where like basically you're to say like what can stop it from having the other attributes um um a substance not a substance of its own kind because there can't be another substance of its own kind not a substance of another kind because they can't act on each other so nothing can stop it from having all the other attributes so i i in other words i i think that's what spinoza would say that um that you could go that way if you wanted to but it would have the same results yeah, but like let's say that, that Spinoza, instead of uh, offering up God, he offers up not God, who's an almost absolutely supreme being with infinity minus one att attributes. Uh, and that's, you know, like his, as a substance, right? Like, insofar as he doesn't offer up God, can not God basically play the same role, except it doesn't have that one attribute that. Uh, it would well, have to not have an infinite amount, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, so there's a further wrinkle. It's going to turn out that of all the of the infinitely many attributes, we only know two of them: extension and thought. <laughs> Some people say, a lot of people say, and I'll I'll try to explain why when we get to the place in book two where this kind of um, comes to a head that. Spinoza actually thinks there are only those two attributes and that two equals infinity for these purposes. I, I, I've been tempted to think that myself. I understand why people would want to say that, but on the whole, I feel like that's really stretching interpretation. I mean, but so, but anyway, so when you talk about subtracting one of them, like we actually don't know what any of them are. I mean, it's the same thing Descartes said, right? That, 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 that God, you know, like basically, Really, in the third meditation, all the meditator really proves is that God has infinite will and infinite power or something like that. You know, I mean, that it's all the other perfections that God may have are beyond the grasp of the meditator. <laughs> yeah. So infinite attributes, right? That must be everything. So that means that God also contains finiteness or finitude as well as thoughtlessness <laughs> well um so i mean that's a good point and it's getting close to one of the things that Kant says about the ontological proof um but so for the ontological proof to, to work, one thing you need is that there has to be a clear distinction. But this came up last time too, I think. There has to be a clear distinction between positive and negative. Right. I remember. Yeah. So that like, clear distinction between something that's perfection and something that's a lack of perfection. Right. And yeah, so a lack of perfection is not, could be the attribute of a substance, obviously. Um, so, um, I mean, and and that rules out not only like thoughtlessness, but all kinds of things that you might think like color or something like that, right? I mean, it's, uh, um, like, uh, or it's supposed to anyway. Like you're supposed to see that those things are not um, purely positive, that they contain some mixture of negation or something like that. Yeah. Sir, when we were discussing the like perfection of God last class, I think we discussed how there was this idea that God or like a perfect being is something that is like I don't know if you call it self-causing, but like it sustains itself. It only needs itself to be sustained. And um I think that like clears up a lot of questions I have about like why. I don't know why the lines of proof work, but I'm kind of confused, like how, like that would make sense. Like, I don't know why. Why is there like a? Why can't there be a perfect cause? Why, why can it only a perfect being sustain itself, or why can a perfect being sustain itself not be? Well, I.
So like I can answer that in the kind of vague way or I could give Spinoza answer. I mean, Ray, like the vague way is like being caused by something else is, is itself an imperfection. Right. So uh, like something that's caused by something else, just by virtue of that lacks some perfection. It depends on something else. Um, so it's not primary, it's secondary, right? Um, that's <clears throat> at least that's the way people think about it. I'm, whether that's really right, I don't know. <laughs> but um, so... Uh, um, so that's why uh, if there is a perfect being, it has to be self-sustaining. It has to be uncaused or self-caused, which perhaps mean the same thing, but yeah. Um, yeah, isn't there a part in one of the scolia yeah, where he talks about like, I think it's in, in Proposition 11, I think, in the scolia that I asked. Yeah. It's like, okay, well, say that there was something else, or no, it's, I'm leaving it, I'm sorry. But there is some scolia where it's talking about like, Imagine that there is something else which has like an infinity of, of things. Uh, what caused that? You know, uh, you say that it's not God. Okay, well, what caused that? And you can't just have an infinite regression here. There's going to be some final point, and then it's uh, it's God. It's, it's always going to end up with God or something like that. I, I forgot where it was, but um, after the points we had today. What's that? I'm pretty sure that the problem in the other ones we write to today. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's a traditional kind of argument, but I don't think Spinoza makes it here. So I don't remember it. Um, and, uh, right, I mean, there's a traditional kind of argument for the unity of God, which says something like, <clears throat> If there's two gods, then or well, maybe you're thinking about uh, about the thing about the like the number of like how many human beings are there? There has to be an explanation for oh, maybe that's what you're thinking. Right. And that is kind of a version of the traditional argument, right? Where he says that that um if if there's if there's a number of things of the same kind that the number doesn't follow from the nature of the kind. Right? So, like, I mean, uh, um, you can't derive from the nature of a horse how many horses exist. So there, ha so if there's a number of things of the same kind, uh, there has to be something external to their nature that caused them to be that number of things. So like if there were two, yeah, and and this is he says this is an alternate proof. I think it's in the scolium to uh, It's the one where he suddenly stops and lists a bunch of principles. Eight. Yeah, scolium two to proposition eight. Right, in the middle of page 35. Hence, we can derive in another way that there cannot be more than one substance of the same nature. Yeah, that I think that's the argument you're thinking of, right? Yeah. So it's, so wait, why are you bringing that up? I don't know. Oh. <laughs> no, I mean, it's interesting, but I, I mean, so uh, that's something involving something else that causes it. Yeah, that so, so in that proof, he connects that to disunity, right? Again, it's like it's a it's an old Platonic thought that you know, unit that unity is the highest form. Um, so uh, the, if something exhibits disunity, that means it's dependent because something external to its nature must have determined how many there are. <laughs> yeah. Part of the nature of something too, though, is 
how it re uh, relates to other things. Like for example, you said because we don't, or because of the nature, or sorry, from the nature of the horse, we can't find out how many there are. But if we like take in the environment it's in, the amount of resources available, the other things there, you could probably make an estimation at least of. I mean, I'm probably just totally missing some conceptual point here. But I feel like if we're given the nature of something and it's like uh, strength in relation to other things, we might have an idea of how many times it might be appearing. Right, but I mean, but uh, I think what you're saying is right, but it doesn't go against Spinoza's argument, right? Because as you say, you have to compare it to other things. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so that means other. it's dependent on other things, right? Like horses need resources right. to, to eat and reproduce and whatever. And like part that's part of what determines how many of them there are. Um, and, uh, you know, that can't be true of a self-sufficient, self-caused being. So it was in the it was in the it was in a meditation in Descartes where he was talking about like if you assume that something if the cause of this that there was some other cause eventually you can't. It was Descartes. Oh, okay, that was take all, right. all right, but I mean, but there is a similarity between that and what Spinoza says in that second scolium. Um, okay, anyway, how much time do I have left? Oh, three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> It's okay. I think we got to most of the main video, although maybe not in the order I plan to, but um, um, yeah, it's basically, I'll say, you know, so like once this happened, we we were like, our fate was sealed. We were already headed for this. Um, and this looks really easy because of Proposition 7. I mean, so in other words, Proposition 11 is actually, or at least the first proof, right? And he gives three different proofs because it's so important. It's the existence of God, right? He gives three different proofs. Well, because it's so important because he wants to show that he can give versions of other traditional proofs, I think. But the first proof is really short, right? If you deny this, conceive if you can that God does not exist. Therefore, by axiom seven, his essence does not involve existence. But this is absurd by proposition seven, right? Proposition seven says that in any substance, its essence involves existence. <laughs> Therefore, God necessarily exists, right? So it's a very short version of the ontological proof because we've already you know, done the ontological proof for every substance in Proposition 7. So now we just have to say, it, you know, God is defined as an infinitely perfect substance. Forget the infinitely perfect part. Just for the fact he's a substance, he has to exist. <laughs> yeah. What would you say about the idea of potency? Because I remember there's a part in the, the reading, and I really liked the part where he said that to appear is to manifest like a, a power, so to speak. Like there's, you have to have a power to appear basically uh, materially. Would you say that there's like a hidden potency behind the appearance, or is it kind of like the Sartrean case where the appearance is the is the essence of like a, of itself, you know? Because um, it seems like you'd probably be in the latter argument since it seems like he's kind of a, like an appearance material type of person. Okay. Yeah, and then there's what. I think instead of appearance, she should be saying existence here, but that would be that would be right for the Sartre case as well. I mean, it comes from Heidegger, right? Like that's where the term existentialism comes from. Um, but yeah, that's kind of um, so. Like existentialism does say that um, <clears throat> it's something about our essence or our existence being essence or something like that. So it is related to this traditional doctrine about the, the, the essence of God involves existence and not like sort of by accident, but because Heidegger is thinking about stuff like that, right? So, but I, I think it would be too complicated to try to explain exactly what's the relationship. The phenomenal aspect in the existential case, because that's an appearance and you said more than existing. Well, it's just, I mean, ex existence is what, actually happens in this third proof, right? To be able to not exist is weakness. On the other hand, to be able to exist is power, as is self-evident. 
Um, it's not really self-evident, but okay. Um, well, I mean, I guess it's self-evident. I don't know. Um, all right. Um, yeah, I just I just wanted to say that this there's more to, to that even to that first proof than meets the eye. I think you actually need propositions eight, nine, and ten to make this work. Um, and basically because you need to show that um, the different attributes can't interfere with each other, they can't exclude each other. Um, but uh, I'm out of time, so I won't talk about that and talk more about Spinoza next week. <laughs>